My name is John Rogers and I'm in the middle of my two acre garden. I've been growing things here since 1980 and I'm very interested in biochar, a soil amendment that uh, has much promise. So I've been developing a way to make a lot of it quickly, and I want to show you how you can do that with four top lit updraft kilns, which I'll elaborate on. But come, let me show you what I do. And biochar has been a fascinating subject. I wish I could get more of it. I haven't found any available locally, and I think that's true in most places. So I set out to make as much as I could, as fast as I could. So I've developed a process of using four top-lit updraft kilns, uh, like a rocket stove. And uh, with these 55-gallon drums, with 40 holes in the bottom of each, I can uh, dump in wood chips, which I get almost free from the power line trimming company and uh, dry them in my driveway and in my yard and take those dry chips and put them in these barrels and burn them from the top down using a chimney which is an afterburner an adapter that makes it fit tightly enough and loosely enough to accomplish both of those tasks so I find that I can burn four in a sequence and in an hour and a half be done with that burn and then continue. The barrel I just rolled out, I roll another empty in, fill it with chips and start again. So in a day you can, you can make a, a cubic yard of char maybe in six hours. So this is the raw material for the biochar I made. It comes from a contractor that works for the power company and they trim the power lines, any trees near the power lines. So it's wood chips, leaves, branches, some trunks, and uh, it comes kind of moist from the chlorophyll, and it dries here in the sun. I spread it on the driveway or in unused portions of the garden, and in a few days it's almost completely dry. So this is biochar. It is uh, wood that has been roasted in a low oxygen environment. What's that called, John? Paralysis. Pyrolysis. I'm not sure how you say it. Sounds like paralysis. Paralysis, but it's pyrolysis, yeah. It'll make you stiff. So it's uh, carbon black. It's, uh, when it's dry, it, it has the, it, it clinks like broken glass. This is wet, but um, it, would, it would tingle. Um, it's amazing stuff, though. Very absorbent. Um, there's probably acres and acres of surface area in this small amount. I should sell it by the acre. Uh, but it does wonderful things to the soil. Let's experiment with it. Let's find it, what it does in every soil type. I'm in Central Florida. I have sandy soil. I can't wait to get some of this going. And I'm told uh, it accumulates uh, in terms of its benefit. So the first year you may not see as much as the second, third, fourth, or fifth. So I'm excited about testing it. I want to make lots of it. And I'm looking for ways of doing it, and I'm uh, going to show you in some top-lit updraft kilns, burned four at a time. When I first heard about biochar, and I wanted to make as much as I could, as fast as I could. So I made these biochar kilns out of 55-gallon barrels. I punched about 40 holes in the bottom. They are small enough to not let my little finger go in, but they are the primary air holes. So, and if we do this with four kilns, we can do it four times as fast. So the first step is to load the wood chips into the kiln. These come at this size because that's how they come out of the chipper. About how much are you putting in, John? I'm going to fill it to the very top. I'm going to put 55 gallons of wood chips all the way to the top. And it's important that they be evenly spread and even density.
These are dry chips. They've been uh, drying in the sun in my yard and on my driveway. What, what kind of, what is that, John? So it's a mixture of whatever the power company contractor cut the, uh, near the power line. So it's, uh, it's native pine, it's oak, maple, pepper tree, an exotic called pepper tree, um, lucana, just whatever was growing in the way. Most of these are fast growing trees. So uh, I'm really not too worried about what kind, but I do want it to be uniform in density. And so that's at the top, not packed, but distributed evenly. So the kiln is loaded with dry wood chips to the top, and I'm building a starter fire on it now. The core is pine cones, over that is pine straw, and over that is um, palm, palm boots, uh, pine branches, just whatever's handy. And uh, we'll let this burn for two or three minutes, and uh, then I'll be back. So the starter fire is now going, and I'm going to rake the glowing embers evenly across the top of the unburned wood chips. So you want an even fire because it will burn downward. So there's the fire evenly on the dry wood chips. Here is an adapter made from the bottom of a 55 gallon drum. It has little uh, fingers to grab hold of the kiln barrel and that starts the uh, chimney. And here's a smaller barrel with the top cut out to make the chimney and afterburner. So, see the flames licking at the top? And uh, I can hear the rush of air. Right now it's a very hot fire. It's uncomfortable to be standing here. So this is a top-lit updraft. T-L-U-D, kiln. So the fire started here. The burn line is probably an inch below that now, and it's burning toward the incoming primary air, which is being drawn through the drum, through this chimney, the chimney effect, which is also the afterburner. So it's a really sleek design. Uh, it's the theory behind a rocket furnace. So you can see those talked about. So in the next hour or so, maybe 50 minutes, maybe an hour and, and 10 minutes, this burn line will work its way to the very bottom and we'll probably see uh, a different color smoke coming out when the char starts to burn. But right now it's actively burning downward and uh, it's not contaminating the char that it just made because when the oxygen comes through the burn line, it is consumed in making char. And the products of combustion do not include oxygen, which has been stripped away. So that's why the char that we're making, the charcoal, is not turned to ash. So I will now build another uh, starter fire on this one, and we'll keep these barrels going about 15 or 20 minutes apart. the second barrel loaded with dry wood chips and we're starting it about 12 minutes after the first. Pine, cones, pine needles, palm boots, whatever's handy makes good kindling. We're just trying to get some hot coals on top before we put the afterburner and chimney on it. The third starter fire is on the third barrel, and so I'm going to rake the coals evenly so that everything burns evenly. Here's an, an adapter, uh, slightly different. It has a smaller top for a smaller chimney. This is a rusted out 16 gallon barrel. I'll stick that on the adapter 
and that starts the chimney effect. Because remember, we want a top lit down updraft. So the flame front burns down, the incoming air burns up, or is pulled up, it's pulled through this chimney, which is an afterburner. So once some of the moisture is burned off, you'll see almost no flame or smoke. And that's the third barrel. We're probably a half hour into the sequence. We started over there. We're working clockwise. So the third kiln is now running. And I'll go right down the time. An hour into this burn, and I can tell by looking down in there, this one is ready. So I'm going to quickly take off the chimney afterburner and the adapter. And then I'm going to stir the char with a pitchfork when the kiln has 40 or so holes in it. So the top is closed, the bottom's closed, and this is now beginning to cool. You can see the ash marks that have fallen through the holes, another indication that it has burned all the way down. I will sweep that up before I put the next barrel down, just because that's what I do. The second barrel in the sequence. It is now done. I removed the chimney afterburner, the adapter, and I stir the charcoal with a pitchfork to convince myself that it is all finished. And it is. So here's a lid to stop the air from the top. Putting it on the soil stops the air from the bottom. And here's one I took apart about 10 minutes ago. And I will now dump it. And spray it with the hose. I want it to continue to burn in this oxygen-rich environment because it'll just turn to ash. So this quenching is very important. This preserves the char. And I am uh, serious about it. Enough to use a rake. Because the middle is still very hot. I can see some ash in there, but it's mostly carbon black. And it's finely grained. It broke as I stirred it with the pitchfork, so there, there's no further processing needed. This is usable as is. I would just um, charge it with something. Perhaps charging? Or, what, uh, what do you mean by charging? I would um, expose it to compost or compost tea or worm tea or um, rotting mulch. Sometimes I apply it to the ground and immediately mulch it with manure or whatever's handy. And that uh, is called charging. So that is, uh, is done now. It's usable in a few minutes when it's cool, but I'll just leave it for the bed for the next one to be dumped on. And when I get enough, I'll start carrying it around in a wheelbarrow. But you can do this at home with very simple tools. And I recommend making as many as you can.